Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Maybe I should just do the entire stream in triplicate, triplicate, triplicate. Happy 22nd of December as I'm recording this and streaming it live and in person from a bunker deep in the bowels of Brooklyn, New York. Happy holidays, everybody. Don't have a lot of program programming notes, just picked some things out of my reading queue, stuff that I had bookmarked here, there, and everywhere. thought I would go through them. Uh, I, I think I picked these out mostly in order. I didn't cherry pick too much, but you know, I looked at things that caught my attention that I hope will be interesting to you all folks who are watching this. Hey, walking the path. Well, good morning to you, walking the path. Good afternoon to me, but... Good whenever you happen to be, wherever your time zone happens to be in this great, wonderful world of ours. I will just hit right to it. Let me share the screen here. This is posted to Reddit OSR. I don't know if I, I ran through this. I definitely didn't read it before. I'm not sure if I stumbled across it on one of my OSR Reddit roundups. I didn't have time or I read it. I do peruse the Reddit other than the roundups occasionally. I'll put a link to it. Links are all the stuff if you are on YouTube because I do post this video in several places. Any of the any place where I was able to put in the description has the links to all these already set in. I am also posting it here in the chat. So if you're on something that can follow the chat, you can see that one. I'm going to switch to a image. Switch to the image because I posted it as an image. The author, Robin Fiarum at ayalath, I-A-L-A-T-H dot com. I think that's what it is. Images by Jason Glover and some from the public domain. It looked pretty cool. People are always looking for things about base building and domain and castles and things. So this seemed pretty cool. This one is entitled Adventuring Base of Operations. And this was posted three months ago to Reddit. Uh, to Reddit. I'm not sure when it actually was created, but it came to my attention more recently. Adventuring base of operations. Every adventuring party needs a way to spend their hard-earned treasure. Here are some system agnostic rules for base building. Start with a core module, then invested modules and hirelings as you see fit. The system is intentionally abstract and the referee is expected to fill in blanks on the practical benefits of the modules and the hirelings. Invasions. With glory and fame comes danger. The higher the total cost investment in a base, the higher the risk to be invaded by conquering forces. Once a week, roll a d10. On a 1, the base gets invaded. Roll on the table below to see how large the invading force is. The roll is modified by the total cost of the base divided by 100, rounded down. This is similar if you follow the Twilight 2000 read along that I just went through this week and started last week, finished this week, kind of a similar thing in which in Twilight 2000, the concept was, Hey, finding safe places, finding a place you can hunker down. If, if it's either a temporary encampment or some kind of uh, permanent or semi-permanent base is great. But the longer you stay in one place, the better chance are that other things, other factions, other, operators in the area will notice you come calling on you and potentially come calling with force. This is very similar. So I like that. And we have a table getting a little swig of water for the working man, which has that value, which is D 100. Well, they say D 100 plus cost divided by 100. Is that what it is? The cost of my the total base. I don't say what D100 plus cost. So they, they, this is a little bit different there. So that you're in the text, it just says total cost of the base divided by 100. The table seems to be saying to add a D100 to the cost and then divide that by 100. I'm not sure if it matters. I'm curious which one is correct. But in any case, however you want to arrive at your number, obviously adding the D100 is going to up the stakes slightly since at the high end of the scale, you're going to at least go from one that you could potentially go up a couple of categories. So if you were to roll a hundred, that takes you past the lowest things on that table. Actually the first two lowest things on the table into mercenary. So for, for in order of, I'm guessing, well, presumably difficulty, certainly in terms of the numbers, 
you can either have a D4 local thugs, D6 bandits, D8 mercenaries, a war band of D10 strong, militia D12, battalion D20, army D100. I, I would probably change these numbers. I think these are numbers attacking, but it some of them don't come entirely make sense. So I would never see... Could you ever see, okay, so let me put it this way. Could you ever see, could you envision, you have got, let's say you found a manor house. So not a full castle, not a full keep, anything like this, but some kind of manor house that's out there and you've taken it over and you've been making your, uh, you've been doing your fixer upper, fixer upper thing to it. You've been fixing it up and you know, you're a, you're a standard party, say four or five characters, four or five hirelings, let's say. That are with you, and then maybe you have some local folks. I didn't want to even call them hirelings, artisans, crafts people who are there working. Could you see one thug showing up? One. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty ballsy thug, right there. I mean, one, one guy just, just step two, steps up, you know, st steps to you, up in your, comes to your residence and starts, I don't know, threatening you or, or wanting to extort you, uh, I'm not even sure, but I just can't see one. One doesn't make any sense to me at all. It's not even, I mean, that's even less than you would get in just your random encounter it, by the book. I don't, I'm not sure how many, um, I'm not sure how much of that stuff I would look at and say, you know what? This one guy makes sense. And, and the thing is, I guess why I'm stressing on the one guy is because you could get a one, a battalion of one, an army of one. I, I would, I would rather, I don't even care about the, the die. You could just stick with D6s, but I would say, okay, local thugs, maybe you say 2D4, bandits, 2D6, mercenaries. I would even jump it up, 4D6, war man, 66 I mean I don't even know or, or d6 times 10 d6 times 5 those numbers should you should not be able to like, get the same number a, a single digits for anything past local thugs pretty much now nothing says the army of one seems unrealistic but there are a lot of commercials about it but I'm bum yes walk in the path with a separate question says the prices are in silver is that normal uh, it's not normal to the original games, but OSR, and I do this myself, I have moved to kind of a silver economy, something that just makes more sense than a gold-based economy. So a lot of things end up being in silver pieces. I haven't checked. We haven't gotten there yet, and I haven't checked. You know, you can check the math to see if they match up. But yeah, I, I think just a lot of folks have moved to in the OSR space thinking in terms of silver with gold being a bit rarer, more valuable in a sense. So things are in silver which I have actually done in my game. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a modern thing. Obviously, if you go back to BX Prime, the original BX, and and I guess everything in, in Dungeons & Dragons is still standard is, is gold, I think, right? And there may be some things, like I think if you go to a tavern, you're, you might paint silver pieces, which is about everything else is in gold. But the trend has been to move to silver pieces. So I would adjust those numbers. Two or 3D4 thugs, D6 times... Three, or if you want to do 3d6 bandits murder certainly you get to war band maybe if i was going to do d10s i'd want to do d10s times three militias and i would probably flip flop those because when i think of a war band just you know this is where naming comes in so on the one hand you just think of naming you, just, you, you i could see the creator going i just need some different names for things okay thugs bandits mercenaries what else is there right well what is a war band made up a war band is really made up of mercenaries unless we're going to say that a war band is more than that. like what is like what differentiates war band from mercenaries if we're looking at it and it's just numbers well then we don't really need that we could just say hey these are all we could just say everything from mercenaries down it's all mercenaries but it's going to be how many if we're if we're going to use the terms to define some kind of quality of them that local thugs the least concerning they're not very strong. They're not very organized, whatever. Then bandits, you go, oh, maybe bandits a little bit more. Oh, mercenaries even more. Well, then what is a what is a war band? Because if I'm going to compare a war band to a militia, my sense would be that militias would be less powerful than war bands. That it would be, 
I wouldn't even put a, a militia as less powerful than mercenaries. The only reason why I might put them above it is maybe that if, if militia might imply some kind of local authority that you're angering a local lord, which could then bring down other people. But I also think of militia oftentimes as your peasants, your villagers. Something's happened, round up the militia and go. They may have numbers, but they don't have skill. So this, so I might, I, I might flip flop those around. I mean, I, I really appreciate the idea, and I'm certain that this was something like, hey, we're trying to do this in one page, so we can't really define what we mean. That you know, again, what separates what army, battalion, war band? Those sound like uh, military forces. Army certainly, battalion just a small. I mean, army and battalion are essentially the same. It's just a matter of the numbers. You might say, well, a war band is less organized. If you want to say something that if we're talking. Army and battalion are things. Now, these are literally military forces potentially put together by a culture, a society, a government, an arm of the government. Whereas a war band, maybe you could say this is a similar thing, but it's more personal based. It's not so much that a whole culture, it's more than maybe there's a particular powerful leader, but it's not someone's whole government kind of thing, if you want to make that kind of statement. And then mercenaries, you're saying, are probably even more loose than that. They're kind of here. Maybe there's a leader, but they're not as professional as a war band. And then down there from bandits to thugs. Oh, Bob Mosel says, I'm reading this wrong. Those aren't number appearing. It generates an attack value. Oh, is that what it is? Well, thank you, Bob Mosel. Maybe I was wrong. I didn't read long enough. Walk in the past says, I think militias have average citizens and war bands have warriors. Okay, well, let's look to see. So I was thinking that was number attacking, but Bob Mosel says it's just, it's an attack value. So let's see what they say. So maybe maybe I was leaping too soon. This is where I think, as usual, I like to see everything. Give me all the um, give me all the terms you're using. So I look at attack like number attacking, but apparently maybe it's not. So let's see what they're saying. Even then, I would still want to flip-flop militia and war band. And I, and my, I think my statement still holds about these things. It's a little bit unclear what some of the, what's the differentiators between some of these. But in terms of the numbers, maybe that's more. I, I'm still curious because you could get the attack values all being one. And I still don't like that even if it isn't number attackings and it's some other, if it's some other uh, numbering system. Oh, I didn't mean to show that spam. Getting a lot of spam today. Let's... Bob Mosel says, 45 years of war game experience have paid off. Yeah, I don't have a lot of war game experience. I've read books on war gaming. I'm kind of keenly interested in it, particularly as it pertains to OSR play, but I have actually not played one. So I'm falling into the trap that I think, hey, it's a good lesson. That's that kind of trap you could fall into when all you've done is read something and you haven't played it where you kind of sometimes totally misunderstand things because you're looking at it on the page and not how it would appear when you're playing it. And I've often found some of the criticisms of, OSR and kind of OSR systems or old school systems looking at the original rules very lacking because the people have clearly read the rules but not tried to play them so they're missing that piece of okay well what does this actually look like when you play it as opposed to what it how it might feel to you as you're reading it in this case I might have run afoul of that but I, I do maintain that there should be no there should be no circumstance where the same however we're doing this attack value some measure of their deadliness in some level where local thugs equals an army. There should be no way that takes place. Bob Mosel says, hit me up someday if you really want to. Well, I might do that. I, I, I think what I'm going to do is hopefully if once, gosh, who knows when the COVID's the gift that keeps on giving, whenever I can really get into and hopefully get into a place in, in my life or I can attend more cons and maybe do more traveling out to stuff and doing it. I definitely want to hit up some places that are doing some war games where I can watch them being played, maybe participate in some way and kind of do get more into that. Cause I am interested in, and I have like, I have Donald Featherstone's some of the classic war game stuff that he's put out and some other classic war game books. And I've read all about it because there's some really interesting stuff in there. And I hope to bring some of that stuff into the channel at some point, but Man, the the don't ask me why the uh the the spammers are just hitting the stream with force today. With force. 
Okay. Resolving invasions. Roll your base's defense die modified by your total defense value versus the invader's attack die. An equal or higher roll means the defense was successful and nothing happens. Otherwise, roll on the defeat table. A natural one is always defeat. We don't know yet. So I wonder if this is a little bit, they're putting the cart before the horse because we're getting, we're sort of getting the stuff that we can't resolve until we've gone through all the rest of the table. Ah, link in. The spam must flow. Bob Moss says, Vassal and Tabletop Simulator are the way to go. Yeah, Tabletop Simulator is that kind of thing that I need to do a better job of learning because I find it, not that any specific thing in Tabletop Simulator is impossible to understand, but that, I feel like that really, a VR, if I had a VR headset, you could do that with Tabletop Simulator. If they haven't done that already, I think some kind of VR interface with Tabletop Simulator would just do so much because translating what they want you to do with this kind of physics virtual reality of the tabletop with me with the mouse just for me it doesn't it don't work uh walk in the path spam is the mind killer i i'm totally down for some dune especially classic dune quotes so i i, I do think that maybe they could have kept invasions and resolving invasions for the end so that way they could talk more about this stuff but okay at least we figured out these are attack values i still don't think i will still maintain that local thugs should have no overlapping attack values with an army. It just shouldn't happen. Armies should just have some minimum amount of just damage that they can do. So I would probably do, if you want to do something like that, maybe I would say 5d20 or I don't know, something else. Something where, where you can say, okay, the, the minimum they can do is five. The most local thugs can do is four. But I would what I would do is I'd want to look at those minimums and say, okay, whatever the next group up is, they're going to do, they're going to do, Maybe there could be some overlap between thugs and bandits, but not between thugs and the army. Just ain't going to be able to do it. Oh, they did add VR to tabletop scene later. Well, now all I need is VR. <laughs> oh, look at that. In a, in a few decades of running this channel, maybe I'll earn enough, earn enough coin to spring for. God, but then Facebook owns that one. I hate to, I don't want to give Facebook money. They've got, the, that's the one VR thing they own. I got, I'll, I got, yeah, that's, uh, when I get, when I get there, when I get there, I'll get there. Um, there won't be a lot of overlap because defense cost is added as a base number. All right, let's hold on. Let me get back there. Defense die modifier, total defense value versus the, the invaders attack die An equal or higher role means the defense was successful and nothing happens. I mean, yes, but I mean like, you know, local thugs could roll four army could roll a four. And I just don't think army and thugs should ever be rolling the same. Um, you know, I, and I, and I think certain defense, and I would also say too, there should be there at some point you just reach, there should be some kind of, you need to have a minimum defense value to withstand an army. Uh, let's see. What are we looking at? Says Terrence, we're looking at adventure base of operations. Bob Mossel says, Nope, I'm wrong. I could be, well, where does it say, where does it say? It says, you're going to roll your base defense die, modify your total defense value. Okay, we don't know that. We don't know what that stuff is versus the attacker's attack die. That's it. So their attack die could be the same. A D100 can roll one through four. A local thugs, all they can roll is one through four, but there are still four digits that you get same for arm for thugs and army. And I think ultimately I, I disagree with that. But let me move forward. And Bob Mosdell, feel free if you need to write something larger. I know that this chat space isn't enough, but I just feel like that there should not be any kind of attack overlap. And, and, and that also would mean, at least in my hands, if, if I'm seeing this correctly, that an army will do some minimal, you need some minimum amount of defenses to withstand an army for any extent of time. Whereas some local thugs, you could have three sticks staying together and potentially get over it. All right. So moving on from there, defeat, we have some different consequences. Uh, defeat invaders take control of the base. That's on a one. All modules are destroyed. All hirelings are killed. That's on a two partial defeat. 50% are destroyed. 50% are killed partial 25% are destroyed. 25% of hirelings are killed parlay pay 20% of total base cost and tribute or six parlay pay 10% of the total cost and tribute. Okay. So Bob Mossel is trying to lay this out. Let's say I have a tower 4,000 divided by 100. So you have a base 40. Yeah. I'm seeing the base 40. We also have misfortunes where you're rolling uh, a D20 
once a week just to see and the kind of things we could have is earthquake, revolt, fire, flood, plague, infestation. Bob Mostel, I get it that there's going to be some defense value that obviously thugs aren't going to be able to get over much because their attack can never equal the defense. But what I'm saying is it shouldn't be, there should be some kind of minimal, the, the fact is that you could get lucky with the army and have, let's say, oh, hold on, let's, let's, what's, a, what's a module here? A defensive module of a wall that has a defense plus one that could literally hold out an army. You know, that's a, I don't even know if that's supposed to be an entire wall um, or a wall, or maybe we have, are we, maybe we got to get a core. I guess maybe that's a thing. So we have a core module, which is a, a large house, large house, defensive slots two, And you could put in two good walls, which would give a defense of four. So your large house with two good walls or wall segments, thank you, is four. And there's a chance, now it is a 4% chance, if I'm reading this correctly, but there is a chance, actually more than 4% chance, because you're going to be rolling on top of that, that you could withstand an army with your, with, your, with your large house. Now, maybe my conception of what an army is versus their conception is different. I just don't see that happening. Or that should be like the 1% chance, not a 4% chance. Because on the D100, I could roll one, two, three, four. And if I roll one, two, three, four, your large house with two good wall segments kept out the army. I just don't see it. I see it versus thugs. I don't even think you need the wall, the great walls to hold out some thugs. I totally get that. But I don't see it holding up an army. I don't, I, I and I just, you know, I think that there should be some, maybe look at those core modules and which should be the minimum that can hold up an army. <laughs> Almost the strange things have happened in history. Indeed. But here's the thing, right? With, with something like this, we're not, we're, we're not playing it out, right? I mean, I'm thinking like an army, like what is it? 10,000 man strong. I'm, your one house with five guys isn't holding out 10,000 people that could just burn the house, bring up catapults, ballista, just <laughs> run around the house. You know, I don't know. I don't know. But nothing says to be generous. You could say the roll abstracts everything. So army that rolls a one on attack all gets dysentery or their Lord dies. And there's all go home and don't attack. Yes, I guess that's, that's probably, you know what? Not nothing. I'm probably my brain is short circuiting. That's probably the correct way to look at it. That because we're just, we are not, because that's the thing, Bob Mosel. I don't disagree that strange things haven't happened in history. It's just that those are usually the parts where you're zooming in and you're playing it out. So you're not using a system like this because you're going to sit there and you're going to play out the siege of Robberdale Manor in which case you figure out how to do that, right? You, you you figure out what you need to do and somehow you manage to do it using all your spells and abilities and blah, 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 blah. But we're not doing that. And so I think that you probably look at it and, and again, a whole army, like, right, when these things happen, it's not the whole, an army, maybe a battalion, war band, I could probably see it in some case, a militia, like the whole army, that's, a rough thing. But part of that too is because my conception of the word army is like you got 10, 20,000 guys descending on one house. Like, how are you, how are you keeping them out? Again, they could just push people against the house until the house falls over. I mean, you just, you know, you just can't do it. If it's something like a company of guys come, sure. Or even a battalion or sure. If your house is on a cliff, you know, you're, you're, you're playing Masada, the game, yeah, there's probably some separate circumstances, but again, even Masada fell to the army, right? Once the once the Roman army showed up, it was like, all right, we're doing this. Masada was toast, and and they knew it. So you know, Bama says, yeah, it's not a simulation. Also, maybe not a great narrative generator. I move on. I think, yeah, we can move on. It, it's still really cool, you know. It's just these questions, just asking questions. But certainly, I think we could go the no nothing around. Says yeah, if something like if you get uh, if you get a result like that, then hey, just yeah, something really crappy happened internally with the army, and for some reason they moved on, moved on and left you behind. Um, my scenario won't happen because you add to the attacker's roll. What is with the? I'm getting so much spam. Keeps coming at me here. Terrence, you want a cliffside castle game one day? Well, you could just make it. 
You could just make it. All right. So I, I like this. We got the, the whatever differences appearing we have on the invasions and stuff. It's still it's a cool feature. The misfortunes I like. I mean, it can be kind of brutal. You have a. Let's see. Well, you have a 5% chance of misfortune and then a 16% chance of some nasty stuff happening. So it's a pretty small chance, but you could unfortunately have your have an earthquake which destroys half of your place, revolts, you lose half your hirelings, fire, you lose 25% of your stuff. Flood will destroy 10%. Plague kills 25% of the help. Infestation kills 10%. So basically some bad things, some bad things can happen. Bad things can happen. Okay, so then we get to the core modules. You can start with a house, a large house, a guild hall, a tower, a mansion, a stronghold, a palace, and you get some slots. Mod slots. What are mod slots? I guess just for regular modules. Then we get defensive slots. We get staff slots. You get a die, die, defensive die. You get upkeep, and you get a cost. And the defensive modules, we already looked at the wall. We have ballista, dungeon, moat, ramparts, barracks, and watch tower which each take up different amount of slots, add certain amounts of defense, also add to the upkeep, and then have a base cost. And then we have other modules you can add. They're not giving us what these modules do, simply that they exist, that they're there. We'll have to, we, all, we as the GMs will have to decide what to do with them, but you can have an apothecary, a bakery, a brewery, a forge, a garden, a library, marketplace, a mason, a mine, a museum, a restaurant, a restaurant, a shrine, stables, tailor, tannery, tavern, theater, Winery and workshop. I guess the restaurant and theater are kind of pretty, pretty setting dependent. Still, hey, if you want to have, it's kind of, this is almost a little bit like some of these. It's kind of like, hey, you're building, because I looked at this like you're building your own, your base. You know, here's your base. But uh, some of these would definitely apply almost more to a village or a town. Like you're, you're forming a town. Stuff like museum, restaurants, theaters, taverns. I'm not going to pay in my own house. If, I, if I'm creating my own, you know, my own keep, I'm not uh, for myself, like my own personal castle. No, I'm not putting a tavern in there to pay to eat there. And I'm not having strangers come in and for them to pay to eat. But if I was creating, a wanted to build a town around my keep, then I certainly would want such things. And then we have some things with hirelings that also take up slots. Some of them give you bonuses, defenses, all have upkeeps. I like it. That's cool. I mean, I would want to, you know, again, the, the invasion, the, the invasion resolution, I'd want to tweak. I probably need to look at it better. Bob Miles probably is more right than I am on that stuff. I got to probably mull it over in my brain. I, I, I still have, I still have misgivings about those attack values, but it's not a big deal because I could just take them and change them. And if you like them the way they are, you can use them the way they are. Very cool. I like it. It's very simple. I almost would just prefer just because I, I like I like words that uh, sort of are evocative of the the fiction and the setting. I wouldn't use module. I don't know. It just sounds too sci fi. It sounds like we're building a space station, but I'm not sure what I would call it other than, you know, buildings. Well, I'm also, I think this is one of the cases I have to say I got the game system mechanics I paid for. <laughs> well, yeah, and since this is free, then, you know, I mean, look, you can't complain about it. They did a lot of the work. I mean, even the thing is, even me, if I come in and say, you know, what, I'm going to change this stuff up. They still did 90% of the work. You know, I come in and just tweaking something. So kudos to them for doing it. And I think it's totally workable. And I think if you wanted something just fast and quick, it's a one pager. I mean, all, all the regular modules are fairly self-explanatory. You could have some fun if you wanted to add more meat to that about, okay, we want the apothecary, but maybe we have to find an apothecary first. You can run it. Bakers might be easier to find that kind of thing. Some of these also, you might want to decide, well, are we somewhere that has, do we have access to grain for brewing or honey? If we're going to do mead uh, or it's mead honey, I forget. Whatever one is honey based versus being grain based. Some of the other ones. A marketplace clearly would require people, either villages coming over there or people roundabouts. Uh, all good stuff. Let's see. Now, nothing says 
There's a lot of low hanging fruit when doing left when doing strongholds. When I did this, the best part were random events that happened to the keep. Lords come to talk, wizards ask to live there, cult infiltrates the peasants, undead in the graveyard, a magic herb is found in the keep, etc. Yeah, you can definitely have a lot of fun. I mean, that's the nice thing when your party puts down roots somewhere. You can really do a lot of that. It's one of those advantages to being in a place. I mean, the disadvantage is that, that place can get old and events like that help keep it kind of fresh. There is something fun to getting to go to different, seeing a lot of different terrains and, and biomes and you get to visit jungles and glaciers and all kinds of stuff that most of us, depending on where we live, don't really get to see very much. So we can have some fun with the imagination. But the nice thing about staying somewhere is you really get to have fun with those roots and how things evolve. And yeah, it's really fun when you pull up all kinds of events, which some of that they have here, right? They only list misfortunes. You could have a roll once a week, roll a D20 and on a 10, on a 20, you get something good happens where it could be something like, Hey, you get recognized for this or something comes in or you get, there's, you know, it's going to be a bumper crop. I might even do this seasonally weekly, even though there's a small chance weekly is a lot of dice. I might even just do, Hey, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, each season roll for a fortune and misfortune. Then you can also add stuff in that if you are growing stuff, you have a bumper crop or you have a really bad crop or half of your livestock run away and all that other stuff. There's a lot of, you can really get in there and granular. Of course you need to have players that enjoy doing that. Terrence says it is me. That's with honey. And Bob also says, yeah, the bones aren't bad. Nope. Not bad at all. So that was adventuring base of operations. I threw the link in the chat earlier and it's also in the show description. If you are checking it out on YouTube, and I think Facebook also lets me put that in. If you're happen to be on Twitter, which I also stream this to, then go to YouTube, go to Facebook, or grab it out of the chat. So I'm about to throw this in here. We're on now to the second of these three bits, which is enemy design, minion, foe, boss, monsters, and enemies. Here's a link. I'm posting that in there. This was posted to the V Donut Valley. I don't think it's, I don't see a date here, so I can't, can't comment on how old this is. And I don't see an author. I'm just going to scroll the bottom. Do we have an author here? Okay, so it's posted by someone. Their name is just V Donut. And it was posted May 12th, 2021. So another. Not super new article, but new to me, maybe new to you. Here we go. Well, let me talk first about intentions and goals of enemy design. I think games akin to D&D tend to describe every part of life in terms of statistics identical to player character sheets. On one hand, it creates coherent world with rules applicable to every element. On the other, since these statistics tend to mainly be, tend to be mainly combat oriented, you end up showing GMs and players that everything can be resolved by combat. And everything can be translated to combat. Even if even doors and walls have AC and HP values, tell me I'm tell me I'm wrong. I probably are wrong, but I'm not sure yet. Well, let's keep going. You in the chat, tell me is he wrong? Hence, there is this unconscious trend of solving things through combat, brute force, mechanics of the game instead of ideas of the fiction. And I think prevalence of combat comes from lack of incentives for GMs to look to other ways of interactions. You don't get behaviors and cultures of quote unquote monsters. Okay, maybe you do, but the outstanding bit are combat statistics. Descriptions don't adhere to the notion of tools to interact with. It's just some description for flavor. GMs are people too, and design can help or hurt them as well as everybody else. So I think what they're saying, which I don't agree with, I, I think, but I think people will point to this and say, hey, look, when you're all you're giving are, are combat values, people can look at it as combat, kind of like you look at everything. You know, if you were to put everything in terms of hammer hammers, then people are going to look at everything like nails. If everything is, is distinguished by how much hammer force it takes, then people are going to think, Joy, shouldn't we just kind of hammer this as opposed to using a screwdriver or some other tool or doing something completely different? I'm not sure I agree with this. I'm not sure if this person is speaking of 5th edition or OSR, whatever, because I think in certainly in the OSR, I think we see because of the deadliness of combat, Oftentimes, giving those statistics has the almost an inverse effect. Not that players get to see those statistics necessarily, which I think is one thing, is it seems to be implying that everyone gets to see these statistics, that a player walks up to a goblin and knows that they're AC7, hit points one or two, whatever. And that's not true. 
off the often through familiarity, they may know. The counter to that is these players also know that let's say all all weapons do a D6 of combat. I'm only got four hit points. There are eight goblins. Should I take the chances that none of those eight goblins are gonna be able to hit me? Because if one of them hits me, I might die. If two or three of them hit me, I am most certainly dead. Maybe I should do something else. It doesn't seem like they're that they're seeing that particular part of it. I can understand. Well, we'll see where they're going in terms of their monster design. How this is how this kind of goal, which is presumably to look beyond combat statistics, is going to be reflected in what they're going to try to do and whether and kind of you know how that's gonna how that's gonna work. Um, Terrence says he thinks the analysis is correct for about third edition up all hammers and nails. Yeah, potentially. I definitely think everyone, this didn't start with third edition. I, th I, I think that, you know, that's, I'm gonna go, whatever, I'll, I'll sidetrack away, sidetrack away. Uh, I, I really think that when you look at the way things were designed, that there's this relationship between the player base and the creators slash publishers, whether it's TSR, whether it's Wizards of the Coast, whether it's whomever. Everyone's looking what the other one does. So that the original game came out with this original idea of playing, which tended to be mega dungeons, kind of open world. That was the way it goes. That was this base assumption. Because kind of that's how a lot of war games and things, especially war game campaigning worked. You would throw together. And I forget the guy who had a really famous Hyperborea uh, or Hyborea, not Hyperborea, Hyborea kind of Conan world campaign. And then he even has things in there. Hey, here's a place down settlements, all this kind of sandbox stuff that we you use in sandbox D and D he was already doing it for war gaming. Cause that's what they were doing. And D and D was an outgrowth of that, taking that same kind of systems, whether formal or informal and, and going from there. But there certainly became some point, maybe even starting in the mid to late seventies with people at Gen Con and other places playing modules, playing adventures. And you can see through the eighties adventures changing from being kind of little mini sandboxes to being more. Okay. More like adventure paths. And also from people who, okay, a combat, yeah, we're, we're playing a campaign war game, so certainly there is going to be combat. But as anybody who follows, uh, whether it's military history or whatever, knows that so much happens outside war that almost the last thing is the, the fighting part and all this other stuff that you're trying to do to get in the right spot or avoid it or, you know, pick your, whatever it is, it takes up the majority of it rather than just the fighting. That changes to, no, we like, fighting you know we we really like to fight my players are amped up to go in there and start rolling d20s and swinging swords so things kind of move towards where they look at that and say oh well our players are really every time we put out stuff we're putting out a dds and demigods we didn't mean anybody hit any we didn't really mean for them to be attacked but people are going and, and fighting them because why not and to, to the point of this thing yeah we put we did put stats on gods we gave them Hit points and we gave them armor classes and we yeah we we did this because we wanted to make it a coherent world but the uh, what what happens as soon as we publish those what people are doing is they're going out and they're fighting those people even though that really wasn't our intention in our brain and so we get to eventually hey you know what xp for combat because that's what people really like to do and then that changes and now maybe it's changing it's moving away from that and now it's moving towards other things so you get things like okay well let's look at uh, story-based stuff because story-based kind of games are big. So we'll look at things XP for story goals and things like that. And I think all this stuff kind of moves, right? So I think there was a trends and it maybe crystallized in third edition kind of onward. Didn't start there, but that's kind of where it finished. So I wonder if maybe this person, that's kind of their experience of the game. But we'll see. Bob Mossel says, AD and D went wrong when they started giving gods hit points. Yeah, as soon as you give everything hit points, you know, that, that does speak to this person's point is when you give everything hit points and stats like that, they are, you know, they're they're gonna start to look at them and say, oh my gosh, if 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 Orcus has a minus two armor class, that means I can hit it with something. And if he's got 308 hit points, that means that I can kill it at some point. Bob also says, I also think it sounds like he's playing a game with no realistic consequences of solving everything with combat. I mean, really, D&D started as a mod to skirmish miniature, so what would you expect? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, there is there is definitely some of that. I, I think the, the you know the, the key thing, like I said, is in, 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 in playing out a lot of this stuff, it's kind of like you got to pick your spots. And the picking your spot of what to fight, what not to fight, and that stuff 
which from anybody, you know, when you study warfare, that's so much of it is trying to pick the spot, pick the good spot to fight, avoid the bad spots to fight and figure out all this other stuff and do all the kind of like the diplomacy kind of stuff in games like diplomacy when you're, you're, you're trying, you know, almost all the game is you're trying not to fight, but you're trying to be, or it's not even really about fighting. It's about being on the right sides of relationships so that you end up having numbers, right? That, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of that that I think is in OSR, which helps to diversify it away from just fight, 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 fight. That at some point, some point got, uh, got lost. Brian Smith says, hey, Brian says, as the creator of game content, though, I always figure they need to provide those stats. Some player is always going to say, okay, hit the god with my sword, and the DM has to know if it hits or not. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, and that's the bind, I think, that you get into being in, is you want to make it coherent, you want these things to be there, but then as soon as you put them there, they become kind of fodder. I mean, look, at the, as anything that happens, anytime you hand a book in someone's hands or a game, they take it and they make it their own. And the publishers are going to look and see, well, how are these players making the game are on and push to do more of that. Cause that's what's you know popular. And so you get the game kind of shifting and changing. They look at what's happening informally and then they formalize it. Anyway, let's get back to this. Well, those I mean, that's some great side stuff. And I, I'm really curious now what this person's angle is. I have not, I didn't say this before, but I have not pre-read any of this stuff. I'm reading it first time, just as you Terrence says, wonder how many hit points these spammers in the chat have. I know, right? Jeez. And Bob Mazel says, stop fighting to the death. Uh, yeah. And then another thing says, Brian, I disagree. I can answer that question without knowing. And AC, the attack misses. I mean, yes, that's the other thing, right? Is the DM can just say, you know what? The God decides you can't <laughs> hit them, hit them today. Um, but there's probably a lot to unpack with gods and stuff. I should probably, we should probably do the whole thing on that just because it, depending on what kind of mythology you're using, what version of gods you're using, a lot of times gods could be hit, you know, in, in different traditions gods could be wounded especially if you had the right weapons and other ones they're kind of totally uh out of off the board kind of thing so maybe you kind of want them to be hit but you want it to be a super super special moment and by putting a number on it suddenly a player can get there maybe without undergoing the super special stuff that you don't expect but i think also it's just a matter of people just having fun just being gonzo you know i'm just gonna put this you know you're gonna you, you go to your friend's house when you're eight or ten years old and they just say, okay, I'm going to give you a Vorpal Sword plus 10. I'm going to put Orcus in front of you. Now you beat it to death, as opposed to really earning it through play, whatever earning a showdown with a god would look like. All right, let's talk enemy design, or should I call it NPC design for that matter? Not to antagonize everyone from the start. Distinction between enemies is in the scale. Minions are to be simplest. They are one-hit creatures. They are there to make PC PCs' lives nasty, but not too hard. If you are outnumbered, they may be a problem, but clever use of environment can strike them by a dozen. Players can shine defeating them, but minions, minions are rarely the point of combat or adventure. They are meant to be easily defeatable in opposition to foes and bosses. Minions have this certain role, maybe more pulpy, but also to help the GM manage things. If you get a large group of creatures, it may be hard to manage them as individuals. But with one-hit minions, each with the same statistics, you can easily just tick off the defeated ones or quickly prepare two, three groups of them these are minions with clubs, these have slings, and these have pikes. Now fight. Yeah, minions, I think, if you want to look at it in a less kind of story gamey way, are just your bottom level troops. If you're looking at the kind of food pyramid of an organized force, they're going to have the most kind of low level minions, least trained, least well uh, armored and armed. They're that, uh, you know, ancient armies, the a bulk of their army would be a bunch of these folks who were not. I mean, with exceptions, there were exceptions, but oftentimes were, they were just the lowest, lowest rank had the least going on. Those are kind of your minions. And it totally makes sense that they would, uh, they would be the first to go down easiest, easiest to go down. But in bulk, as in, in armies, they can be, they, they can, under the right circumstances, they they can, they can, uh, really, change you know change a, a loss to a win or or just be your your center but they break easily okay how to treat minions outside of combat they're either very not ready for a fight like drunk bandits they are capable of fighting at fighting but you don't need much to defeat them if they are very drunk sometimes these are just people who cannot fight random farmers townsfolk travelers eventually all creatures naturally more fragile for human standards small monsters spirits or beasts these NPCs don't fight unless they have no other way. Usually they fight to protect homes, families, themselves out of madness, fear, or other strong incentives, including boss authority. 
If there is no such strong reason to fight, expect them to flee at first occasion or even before combat. Most regular people would be in this category. In case there are only a few minions present, you can give them individual 1d8 grit and treat as first level funnel character to spice it up. I'm not sure what a first level funnel character is or what d8 1d8 grit is. Let me let me know if there's some interesting OSR system that has a grit stat. I think of fun, when people love that mention funnel characters, I think of DCC and stuff and I think of them as level zero. So that's the whole point is whoever survives the funnel levels up to level one. I'm not sure if there's a system that has a level one funnel character, but it's not a big deal. Basically, he's saying, hey, you can treat them as a group or if you don't have very many, you can treat them as individuals, however you want to treat them in your particular game. Ah, uh, Bob Mossel, but are the minions militia or warband? Uh, these, these are the important questions. These are the very important questions. Uh, Brian Smith says, interesting how lots of 80s cartoons had a colorful cast of villains as the minions, thinking Skeletor and his mooks. Yep, very much so. In, in that case, yeah, a little bit of a different kind of minion. Your Beast Man and, and those guys. Those are kind of underbosses. Did Skeletor, did they ever have a bunch? Did they ever have a bunch of just like uh, soldier types? I don't even remember. I haven't only watched part one of the new Kevin Smith He-Man so far, but I haven't watched original He-Man in ages and ages. I don't remember if Skeletor, if it was always just Beast Man and those guys, or if there were like uh, Beastlings that Beast Man controlled. Terrence says, I think grit means whatever HP system you're using. I don't think so, Terrence, only because minions in the sense that he sees me using them or whoever the author seems to be using, which is pretty similar to or identical to fourth edition was that they had one eight hit point. They were one hit, they go down. So they could be, however strong, the same strength as normal characters or normal whatever monsters, but you just hit them once and they're out. Hordak had disposable robot flunkies. Okay. And, and Brian Smith, which I agree with, says, uh, it feels super heroic when there's only notable minions with personality. Yes, it does. Because then it seems like everybody... And kind of like in the He-Man mode, everybody's sort of super, super muscly. And man, that's spam. What is going on? Where is Nightbot? I'm going to get in the Nightbot here and, and, and do something. Because man, they keep spamming the stupid, same stupid URL in the chat. Okay. So we got our minions. After minions, we get to foes. Foes are the most common enemy, not in terms of numbers, of course, but in counterability. They follow some of the rules and designs as PC. The scale is they could put up a fight with PCs one-on-one. -on -one. They may be a threat. Of course, fourth tier foe is way different than first tier, which is more similar to a minion, to be honest. But the distinction is more than mechanical durability or, and complexity. Foes are enemies who theoretically could be characters in their own stories and adventures. They can handle their weapons and maybe even have some armor under those pretty close. So if you go from minions who basically are your sort of mooks, villagers, folks that have a hit point, and that's all they got, and that's all they're ever going to get. I know Bob Mossel asked, what did I do to piss off the Russians? I don't know. I have no idea what I did. But they're coming for me, coming for me strong. It's Christmas, Rus Russians, come on. Doesn't, don't, don't spammers take off for, spam bots take off for Christmas too? I don't know. What did I do? All right, so we had minions. Now we have foes that are more one on one matches for PCs. In terms of humans, foe category should be given to anyone experienced in combat some way. Other adventurers, soldiers, veterans, warriors, trappers, hunters, properly trained peasants, or monsters on different levels of power and complexity, or small predators and large herbivores. These combatants don't fear to stand up and fight. Their morale is not crushed by whatever. I imagine lower fantasy settings, this level is occupied only by humans and magical creatures are special and only go as boss monsters. Higher fantasy and Gonzo will include regular monsters beside the strongest and most powerful. Foes will probably try to use diplomacy at first. No one wants to lose a life due to unlucky hit. Foes can have abilities similar to PCs and will probably be and will be probably more complex than minions, especially in tactics and behavior. Uh Bob Mostel with the old uh, what was his name? In post-Soviet Russia, Christmas takes you off. Who was that? What was, what was his name? Was that Yakov Smirnov with the, uh, in Russia, such and such does you? Or is you nice? Hi, guy. When was the last time you've heard Yakov Smirnov? What, what, where, where is he now? Where is Yakov? 
I don't know if you play role play games, Yakov, but if you were to send me a note, I would have you on the channel just just because. You got to be of a certain age, I think, to have any idea what the heck I'm talking about. So apologies for that. I, I got to imagine there's got to be clips on YouTube if Yakov Smirnov, YouTube. Brian Smith is correct. Tis the season for Yakov Revival. That's probably every season, to be fair. But yes, come back to us, Yakov. We need you now more than ever. Bosses are a different category. I don't want to make them just bloated foes. These encounters should not be simple. Think prehistoric mammoth. To hunt one, you have to, you have to set up a trap or at least place with no escape. Then bring your whole tribe or even a neighboring one. Every available warrior. And if you if fought back, you certainly lost some people. It's more like fighting a boss in video games than it is striking never-ending bags of hit points. Specific plays set up fighting sides. Individual strikes don't matter that much. Imagine fighting a werewolf in a setting where it's probably the only werewolf in the world. It has to be huge. It has to be memorable. Or fighting giant robots or high-powered wizards. Also, the bosses don't want to be killed. They won't fight to the death. Giant animal will try to run away when it feels in danger. Dragon would fly from its lair and strike enemies from above. Or even fly away and come back with something nasty. You beat it either by trapping it in place or when it thinks it's invulnerable and some humble hero pierces its heart with an arrow or something. No reasonable being would walk into a trap or just wait for someone to kill it unless it is what it wants. So the first step in beating the boss is make sure it cannot run away. You have to prepare some way of trapping it in place or let it run away after you shatter its will and power. It's an option too. And it would be nice to remind GMs to not make everything kill it or it will come back stronger. Saruman somehow stopped being such a threat. You can do that too. Make them a far part of a future adventure, broken and weakened, or even reformed. So that's I, I the so it's an interesting article. I, I I I like some of what they're doing. I like the idea of it seems like this is I mean, really only the bare, bare bones of the concept is here. I was kind of hoping there'd be some more detail, but maybe that's good because it's already at 52 minutes. I still got the longest of the articles to go. <laughs> Brian Smith says, thought that the ad at the bottom was a graphic. The author used to illustrate a point about bosses. That they're, uh, oh my gosh. Yeah, boss, the, if, if, if you're having to be listening to this later, the image in the ad is a for an ad for Prostate Pro, urologist in large prostate. Do this immediately. Try tonight with a guy on a mat with his legs spread. I'm not even sure what that's supposed to be doing. Um, wow, Terrence said that he's still touring. I, I, talking about Yakov Smirnov, not the urologist and not the author of the blog. Well, good for him. Now, nothing says, is it me or did this start out as there's too much space dedicated to combat, then use the rest of the article to talk about combat? Uh, yes. I mean, there probably is a little bit of that. I was hoping to get to some things as to, hey, here are non-combat things. But yeah, I, I think maybe, I don't want to speak for the author, right? But the, the sense that I might get, and really it only comes into play with the bosses, is that, that if, if you're going to fight it, you have to do more just walk up, start hitting it. It's the whole planning thing and whatever thing. And then bosses are going to use every power to their advantage to get away. But yeah, it's interesting that he starts off saying, Hey, I don't want all this to be about combat. Let's, let's all talk about combat. I, I will say there's probably some interesting bits in here. I liked minions from fourth edition. I think they're great when you need to have just a bunch of smaller go foes, that kind of things like and he mentions too. And I, I don't disagree. You know, Hey, we have 80 villagers are running at you. They're minions. I don't. I don't need to. I don't need to deal with individual hit points. I, I don't care. They're basically one hit and they're down. If you happen to do the cool thing with fighters, where they can take down, I think once they reach hero level, they can take down multiple uh, under one HD creatures. I, I think, and in, in, depending on how you did it, I think some versions are they don't even have to roll dice. I think someone was saying that Gygax's table, you didn't even roll dice, or you no, you might have rolled dice for how many you killed. <laughs> like you just walk up to it and you're, let's say, a level five fighter you would roll the equivalent of a 1d5 and one to five of those guys would just go down or just your level would just go down so you're a hero you walk up to those four villagers and without even having to roll an attack you just wipe them out kind of thing very useful very good for kind of simulating those sorts of things i can see if you're coming up with a way of building creatures and npcs you wanted a unified way of say npcs plus creatures but we're he sort of hints at the beginning, sort of it says, but then doesn't really follow through on it much. Is basically, hey, look, we're not going to really, outside of you know minions. Okay, they're kind of like player characters, but they're one hit point and they're done. 
foes. Those are basically your creatures that are more or less player character equivalents. But then after that, maybe we're saying, okay, look, we're going to be putting that aside. And it's kind of stuff that I've seen. I've, I've dabbled with it a bit. I know like, like Matt Colville talked about stuff that kind of looking at, and, and I think it's, it's embedded in say the way fourth edition into a certain extent, the way fifth edition handles boss monsters, uh, legendary resistances, lair actions, things like, okay, on at this turn, this, thing comes in. Why does this happen? Because it's a boss, right? On a mental level, this is a boss. A boss thing can do boss. A boss creature can do boss things because they're a boss creature. We're not trying to put it in terms of things. Just, hey, it can, right? On on uh, on the first round, it's got this special action call for reinforcements and then reinforcements will appear kind of thing. And we're, we're doing that building up because we want the boss to be special, which is kind of seems like more the whole buildup is I'm going to kind of classify creatures in these different tier or different types because he mentions tiers, but I think tiers is just kind of what level of game you're at. So, uh, you know, your third or fourth tier, you're talking about third or fourth tier of play when you're, say, at levels 15 to 20, that would be your fourth tier or whatever. But essentially, bosses should be special. Treat them specially. So you have to figure out some real way. I, 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 I think you can have both. I don't think you have to totally break all the rules unless you want to for a boss monster. But the point is, which I do, which I do agree with, is that some of these things that we want treated as special, sometimes in the game you get caught up in that you don't have to treat them specially because you don't use them. The dragon that never flies and just sits down on the ground waiting for you to beat it up. A lot of people run dragons like that. It's like this dragon's got wings. This dragon's got all this stuff. Why is it waiting there? I've always felt that way. Why is the, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, to, to capture or kill the goblin king and your party runs into the goblin fortress. And they run all the way down through all the levels of the Goblin Fortress. Finally, on level six, they get to the Goblin uh, the throne room. And there's the Goblin King waiting for you to be slaughtered. Why was he waiting that long? Why didn't he just leave when he could have left? When the alarm came out on level one, that, hey, the party's crest level one. You're all the way down to level five. Why isn't he running? Why aren't there back doors? Why is he in the least, the place with the least amount of escape to get out? Like, to me, I feel like there should definitely be a... You're going to have to scout it out. You should be scouting out that fortress, making sure you've got the exits covered or trapped or something else. You've, you've put booby traps. You've made sure they can't get out. You've tricked them. You've sent somebody in there. You sent some of your hindlings to make a whole bunch of ruckus in the front of the fortress, and you found the back door where you wait. And when the guy tries to scuttle out of there, like, you know, Saddam Hussein leaving Baghdad, you find him coming out of his hole, and, and there you get him. I do think there should be more of that. And same thing. Yeah, you, you, you get this. Thing, you're gonna have to do a lot of that but i also want it me i want it to kind of fit the fiction i don't want it to be well you're gonna have to get 80 people to do this just because i say so it should be some way of making it kind of fit then there's there's probably should be i think ought to be ways if your system can't do that then maybe you got to look at not breaking the system of figuring out why doesn't my system allow me to make a good say woolly mammoth encounter that's going to do that and then what can i do to kind of do that so that i can take those same mechanics and apply that to everybody because sure say i might have uh not have the giant woolly mammoth but maybe i have an owl bear and i want that to be able to cat that those kind of the same features that allow me to run that woolly mammoth campaign that sort of big campaign boss thing i want on a lower level to work for an owl bear so do i need to write specific rules for every monster or can i get the mechanics in a way that give me those possibilities just out of the box as it were the author should play <laughs> fang shui haven't really, haven't really played it. Brian Smith says, yeah, I really would love seeing an example of a bandit as a minion, foe, and boss just to see the main points of each level. Yep, that would be, that would be good. I should, I should introduce the author to my Rakshasa BBEG, which I haven't created yet. And then Brian Smith says, you search the room and rolls random creature, a dragon in a tiny room. Yep, pretty much. Of course, at least in the olden days, dragons could, you know, be shape change and different things. So they could, they could be the ye old dragon in the form of a princess or whatever, a prince, a pauper. I don't think they have that in fifth edition. I think fifth edition dragons, I mean, you can always add it in, but by default, they don't have spell casting, I don't think. All right. This is the one that was on paper the longest to read, and I've left the least amount of time. The Rock Shasha. I have not created the Rock Shasha. I haven't created that either. I'm not sure what that would be. This one, 
Let me get the link for it. This one I think could be pretty cool. There is, there are two of these. So there are, hold on, I go, let, me, let me do things more. First, let me get the link. And I will then fill in the background. Oh, and here comes Nightbot. Nightbot, you let all those spammers go through and then you hit, then you hit up Brian Smith. Wow. Nightbot, you are tough. <laughs> and Terrence says the dragon has lured the adventurers there to help them get out of the tiny room. I need butter, beauty portals, lots of butter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty good. Okay. This one's called the theory of place, a level design philosophy for unexplored twos. Is talking about a video game, Unexplored 2, the sequel to another game called Unexplored. There is a, an article that I also have posted, or not posted, that I also have in my pile about their dungeon design philosophy for that particular game. But this one seemed interesting, and frankly, I just like the pictures. So I glommed onto this one to do, and I didn't want to do two of them in one reading just because they were kind of kind of long, longish. So... I chose this one. We can go back and read the other one as well. Obviously, tabletop and video games are very different, but I think it's interesting. I do think it's often things we can learn from, especially these kind of procedurally generated things, kind of you know, games and whatnot, how they how they do things. Cause I think there are tools that we can apply, lessons learned, yada yada yada. Let's give it a read. To the Wayfarer's legacy leaves the sprawling generated dungeon of its prequel behind. Its grand adventure takes place in an open world filled with bustling towns, dense forests, ancient ruins, and jagged cliffs. Generating these types of levels calls for a different design philosophy, where the dungeons of Unexplored 1 took full advantage of the notion of cyclic, cyclic dungeon generation. We expanded and adapted the level generator to encompass what we like to call the theory of the place. At, at a first glance, the element Elements that make up this theory seem quite obvious, but for us, the structural clarity offered by the thorough descriptions of the elements and their relationships was very informative. In addition, their explicit implementation in our level generator vastly improved the quality of its output. So it seems like what we can get our things or what they're getting out of this things like this kind of cool looking temple on it looks like some kind of terraced cliffs or maybe kind of mesa like formation with. I'm not sure if that brown's supposed to be great with some trees and looks cool. That's kind of a, I don't know, am I the only one getting sort of a cell shaded? Maybe that's just the vibe. It's kind of a cell shaded. I think of Zelda cell shaded vibe, but there's one map or one image. The theory. The theory of the place at its heart is an elemental structural description of level anatomies. It identifies different parts of a level and describes the relationships between those parts much like syntax does for sentences or narratology does for story plots. The theory was tailored for our specific purpose to help generate sensible and interesting levels for an action-adventure game. But we suspect its range of application surpasses that. Certainly, there are other genres within games that can benefit from it. The descriptions and schematics produced by the theory do not directly correspond with level geometry. They are designed to foreground the structural relationships between the level parts and the patterns that emerge from these relationships. As such, a single level schematic can have an infinite number of executions, just like a single valid English syntactic structure can correspond to an infinite number of sentences. Expanding the linguistic analogy further, the theory of the place describes the deep structure of our level designs, whereas each individual built level is a corresponding surface structure. And there's a link I'm not gonna go to, but it goes to Wikipedia, deep structure and surface structure. And just like deep structure are critical concepts for replacement grammars and natural language generation, the deep structure described here really helps to generate levels that feel coherent and well-formed. All right, I needed a drink of water after that. All right, but we got much more to go. The theory presented here is deceptively simple. It might suggest that all levels should follow a singular pattern. However, this is not the intended effect. First, we do not wish to suggest that every level generated in a game needs to follow the structure, although we strongly believe that in a great many cases, the theory of the place will be applicable. Second, and more importantly, we feel that the expressive range of this theory is very large. The basic structure might be somewhat uniform. The specific exceptions and variations of each individual implementation ensures that levels can feel vastly different. 
The theory presented here is very similar to structure theories and design pattern languages found in architecture, software design, and narratology, for example. What all these theories have in common is that they too use a limited palette of common structures to describe, describe an infinite number of possible executions. Ryan Smith says, this is some dense writing. You ain't kidding, but it's good though. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, and there's a lot here. I'm hoping, because again, I have not pre-read this, that we'll get some uh, examples of some sort where we can see this kind of syntax in action. But yeah, I think that's some really interesting ways that this could go, you know, even if we're not feeding into a machine or, just, or, or we're feeding it into the machine that is our own brains versus some computer. Inspiration. There is a very specific context from which this philosophy emerged. As already indicated, Un Unexplored 2 moves the action from dungeons into an open world. Dungeons, obviously, are a common trope in fantasy adventure games. The sprawling structure and endless corridors serve the gameplay requirements most effectively, but conceptually, they are artificial and weird. In an open world adventure game, there have to be many levels that are not dungeons. Even though a couple of classical dungeons are expected in a game like ours, the gigantic 20 level dungeon of its prequel would feel very much out of place. Instead, the adventure sites of Unexplored 2 have to be smaller and make more sense in the context of the world. A keep with a crypt below makes sense. A temple complex hidden in a large cave does as well, but that is about as large as sensible quote-unquote dungeons can get without falling out of tone. More importantly, a classic dungeon, especially generated ones, are designed to be traversed by a player even if the game feigns to resist their progress at every turn. The narrow passages and challenge-filled rooms build up to a to the climactic boss fight at the very end of the dungeon. Often the path leading towards that final room is surprisingly narrow as the player is railroaded past the majority of content the game has to offer. Trying to impose a similar gameplay structure on levels that are not specifically set up as traditional dungeons is pretty hard. Doable if you're designing a level by hand, but almost impossible to replicate when you are generating the level procedurally. But ultimately, it is also quite unnecessary. With generated levels, it becomes more feasible to create levels that offer multiple trajectories through them. It matters less that the player might miss on some of the content because once the generator is in place, extra content is fairly cheap. In addition, setting up levels that primarily pose a challenge for the player to overcome in any way they can, rather than a pre-designed sequence of solutions, plays well into the strengths of the role-playing and roguelike slash roguelite genres. Different approaches and challenges might resonate with the different affordances offered by available play character classes, and the vastly different individual trajectories strengthen the unique narratives that emerge from engaging with a level which cannot exist, which cannot exist through, it cannot exist a predefined playthrough. Who? Oh my gosh! More spam in the chat. As soon as my back is turned. Seriously, Nightbot, where are you? You, you went after Brian Smith, but you're leaving the spammers alone. I'm starting to wonder if Nightbot isn't on the take. That uh, that last paragraph it really could, you could apply that really to a lot of this sort of story versus, you know, heavy narrative versus kind of sandbox, right? It's, it's sort of, we're looking at this kind of sandbox gaming. We want all this stuff that we would probably call just emergent, emergent game, emergent story. It's the kind of things they're talking about where you're, you're not trying to put the characters through a specifically designed experience, but you're having more of a place where you're open to whatever experiences come from it, come from it, and they can kind of get through it and engage with it however they want to and however their classes and their strengths and weaknesses kind of put them in position to. Verbosity is indeed dialed up to 11 on this. And Bob Moss says, I was going to mention Justin Alexander's decasing the dungeon, and sure enough, later the author mentions it. Uh, yep. Yep, multiple pass through is definitely a JK, a JK's thing. Also, I think verticality and some other things. But yeah, ultimately, yes, the 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 uh, multiple paths, freedom to kind of choose how you how you engage with it. For inspiration, we looked at many dungeon level designs of other games, especially tabletop role playing games, as they often manage to create a similar sense of adventure. We hope to inject into Unexplored Two, in particular, the online article on the Alexandrian outlining the design philosophy of Janelle JK's. Proved invaluable. Jacques's insistence on creating levels that are conceptually consistent, offer multiple points of entry and multiple trajectories, leads to a very practical set of guidelines that can be used very effectively to improve almost any site of adventure. So they went from being inspired by role playing games and kind of classic design in role playing games to using it this to then being something that I am looking at to <laughs> provide inspiration back to role playing games. So we're coming full circle. We do have this kind of interesting 
diagram, which I guess we'll get to, which is within some kind of circular space, we have an entrance to a place that has another entrance to a vault. At the core of the theory of the place is the idea that an adventure site is dominated by a place. The main challenge for the player is simply to is to simply reach the place. At the place, the player might still need to solve a puzzle, find a treasure, or defeat a boss. But the main purpose of the level structure is to make sure that the tra trajectory towards the place is possible, coherent, and interesting. The place itself can be many things. It could be clearing a forest, a keep perched on top of a hill, or a treasure room inside a large temple complex. It is possible that the place is subdivided into a number of connected rooms, but even in that case, the place should likely be easily recognizable as a coherent whole set apart from its immediate surroundings. I think the other takeaway we could have is that you could nest this kind of thing, which is the place in one location is then the location for another place, but they should be some kind of distinct thing, right? So you're trying to find the hidden temple in some outer area. In that outer area, the hidden temple is the place. Once you get to the hidden temple, maybe you need to find the burial chamber of the blue -de blue and that is the place in the thing that is now the outer temple right yes it could be but that's exactly what i was saying bob bob Mosley. it definitely has a little bit of that five room dungeons vibe going with it <laughs> terrence asks who wrote this brainy smurf yeah and brian smith is correct i was also having worked in it some develop yeah developers and a lot of times will often write like this sometimes to their detriment um some, but sometimes these are just these are the these are the terms and things you have, so you need to kind of write it out. Okay, so we're getting, but I feel like we're getting into the more actionable bits now. We've gotten, I think I feel like where they was kind of setting up all the ph philosophies and things behind it. Now we can get to the more, the less esoteric bits. I think, as the function of the level is to create a traversal challenge for the player, the place is protected by boundaries and likely has only a few points of entry. One does not simply walk into the place or Mordor, but Mordor is a place. Within the place, there might be a room that is even harder to get into, which we designate as the vault. The vault is a good place to store treasure or any type of collectible level objective that cannot be nailed down. Frequently, the vault is locked and the key into the vault it's hidden somewhere hills elsewhere in the place or placed under the protection of a guardian that calls the place home. So we're now expanding this concept. We have a, the environment is that is sort of the overall area. We have a level entrance. We have some sort of path that takes us to the entrance to the place. And then inside the place somewhere is an entrance to the vault. Normally the player does not start a level in the place. After all, it is their objective to reach the place. So the place exists in an environment, and through that environment, a path should lead from the level's point of entrance to the place. The environment can be many different things, a forest, a city block, a mountainside, or even a more traditional dungeon environment. But it helps if there is some clear contrast between the environment and the place. This helps the player to recognize the place itself, but also can help to explain the boundaries that separate the place from the environment. The environment itself can be hazardous, but should be fully interlinked and traversable. This means that the player can ultimately reach any point in the environment from any other point in the environment, even if it requires the player to deal with the environmental hazards or lock and key mechanisms. For example, the environment might be a forest with a number of narrow paths leading past aggressive sentient trees. The vegetation that separates the paths might not be traversable in and of itself. As long as paths lead to any point of interest within the forest, that is fine. If a part of the forest is locked off by a barrier that requires a specific key to navigate past, then it is important that the key can be found on both sides of the barrier or that the portion of the forest behind the barrier can be escaped by other means. This, is, this ensures that the entire environment is traversable and interconnected. A good litmus test is to imagine the player to randomly teleport to any location inside the environment and make sure that they are not stuck as a result. Even if your game does not have a scroll of random teleportation, it is surprising how often players manage to replicate its effects with other means. Now, while that seems very video gamey, I think there are it's some interesting elements we could take apart. You could think about in terms of a hex crawl, looking at your hex and saying, okay, if, if the party happened to end up in any part, you know, do we have this concept of them being able to get around it? What kind of mechanism we have? And in general terms, I mean, you can always say like, oh, there's these uh, impossibly high mountains you can never get to it. But I think in generally speaking that the player should in some way be able to get all around, all around your hex and then somewhere in that hex, however you want to have it, right, is, is that place. Bob Mosdell uh, mentions Metroidvania. 
And I have that new Metroid, Metroid Dread, but I haven't played it yet. Or maybe I played about five minutes of it. So I think it's interesting to take these things. Some parts of it seem kind of video gamey, like the set paths. But other parts I look at, I think certainly good things to think about in terms of your hexes and your hex crawling when they're entering the hex in which a place is. Think about how that's set up. I also like it is. I think it is interesting. To also think about the two sides of it because oftentimes we'll make the we'll, we'll make a certain challenge that's kind of a challenge from one side, and we don't think of it on the other side. Like, oh, the the thing is separated by some chasm, massive chasm, and then you you might think about well, what happens if you end up on the other side of the chasm? Or what happens, what about the people who are on the other side of the chasm? Like, if I have to deal with it getting over, don't they have to deal with it getting back? And is there a way around it? And sometimes things, the kind of internal logic of a place can break down because it's clearly just supposed to be a challenge for you coming from this direction and not something that really exists as something that as a feature that everybody in that area has to deal with all the time. And that you have people that live in this area that they have to deal with the fact that there's a massive gaping chasm there. So it's a good idea to think about, well, what if the players happen to come from the other side or they got that spell and they got teleported to the other side, or how do the people who I have living on the other side, how do they deal with the fact that they have a, a bottomless chasm between them and the rest of the world? You know, think about what that might look like. <laughs> right. Bob Mullen says, why is there a trap in the privy? Exactly. Uh, Frederick Gore says to check out the rules for that Zelda game they post on Discord. Yeah, I'll check it out. I, I have seen it. Just haven't gotten to it. Uh, Bob Mullen says, must not be too good if you can only play like five minutes. It was just, actually, I just got called away to do other things. It was not, I'm uh, not claiming it wasn't good. It actually seemed pretty cool. But I just had a few minutes just to check it out. And then I just haven't gotten back to it. We're all, my family is all, uh, Animal Crossing. I kind of introduced my wife and daughter to Animal Crossing maybe a month or so ago, and it kind of sucked all of his back in. So now whenever we get on the Switch, it's all about Animal Crossing these days. Get our bells. You know, get our... Go pick fruits and vegetables off the ground. Um, it is... Brian Smith says, it is infinitely easier to avoid these bugs in, in tabletop role-playing games where there's an element of imagination slash incomplete data. That is true, but... You, if you, and I'm thinking about nothing, you've posted on Reddit, so you've been in Reddit, and I'm sure you've been in Facebook, other way, you will often see GMs paint themselves into corners where you think, like, why not just hand wave it away? And they can't, they won't, or they refuse to. So, yeah, it, it is easier if in certain mindsets, but people do definitely trap themselves. So, such things can still be useful, even though I agree, you tend to think of them and go, yeah, well, you can just do something else because you're the DM. The path connects the level's point of entry to the place, and although it is part of the environment, it is typically safer and easier to follow. Basically, the function of the path is to lead the player to the place in order to quickly direct them towards the main challenge posed by the level. This is one that we might not need to worry about in our tabletop role-playing games because we're not under this pressure necessarily to have the players do it, but I think it's sometimes it can be useful to think about. If you're finding the Lost City of Z, you might think at some point there was a road from the Lost City of Z somewhere, and maybe a trace of that road exists, and maybe they could find that as opposed to in some cases, I think even with something like Lost City, there may not be any road remaining, and it is just in the middle of jungles that are uh, indistinguishable from any other jungles. But oftentimes, I think it is, you do might want to think about, well, how how did people, how did this thing exist in the world connected to other places? And if the players can find that connecting connecting point, maybe it'll make it a little easier for them to find the place. Maybe not, but maybe. In most cases, the place is connected to the path through an entrance. We refer to the space or room before the entrance as the antechamber. It's definitely starting to sound kind of five-room dungeon-esque. Conceptually, the antechamber might be part of the place, but it does not need to be. If the place is a castle and the environment is a light forest, the antechamber might as easily be a clearing in front of the castle or an outer bailey. I just need a sip of water here. Oval Team Patrol says, No road, the city was built lost. Yep, that's sometimes how it feels. The city was always lost. It never existed before it was lost. Structurally, it is important that the antechamber is located before the entrance into the place, and as we shall see below, offers the opportunity to place encounters or thematic level features on the obvious path leading towards or lead, yeah, leading towards the place. I think one thing we could take away is I know often, and I like to think of it and not in terms of the meta parts of the structure, but just how it is. However, when we're looking at game concepts like telegraphing danger. And cluing players into what is happening or what is existing in this place, 
thinking in terms of these kinds of meta structures can really be key because if you think about that the outside of the or the clearing let's say between the forest and the castle is this introductory space on a meta level then what it's going to lead me to think as a gm that i want to introduce the elements that are inside the castle here to the party which is a great way of saying here in this area is where i can start to telegraph the nature of the castle to the players, which also makes sense from a fictional point, because if something exists in the castle and is doing stuff in the area, it's going to affect what that place looks. If a dragon lives in the castle, that clearing will probably show dragon stuff or the evidence of the dragon passing. It won't be pristine. And if it is pristine, it probably should be some kind of super pristine, which should be wary to for other reasons, whatever. It should show the stuff being here. But instead of looking at it on that fictional level of, yeah, if a band of goblins live in this house, then the area right outside the house is probably going to look like goblins have been hanging around there because they have been. And then on that meta level, we want to introduce the element of goblins, right? So and, and we're getting the same result, but it's looking from that kind of meta perspective in versus the fictional perspective. But it's a way that they kind of reinforce each other in a sense because we do want to telegraph. So it's good to think about. Let's see. Brian Smith says, I might draw out that little map they have of some entrance paths place to have on hand. Definitely seems useful to have some details in mind for those spots. Yeah, it definitely can be great if you are winging things on the fly, random location, random spot, and you're pulling things up, having some kind of thing of like, okay, here are the elements of that place, whether you use this kind of uh, language they're talking about, whether you're using five room dungeons, is it, it's a good cue to use. Like, oh, the end of chamber, or oh, whatever, the entrance way. This is where I should be setting up the context of the place will lead me to say like, okay, I rolled up a random fortress here or, or say a tower. Okay. I need to start to figure out, I need to know what's in that tower. Cause I need to then set up traces of it outside the tower. So, okay, that's my cue. And then, oh, this is my cue. Right. So yeah, definitely. I think having these kind of structures or, or these kind of language or tools on hand when you're doing a lot of generating content on the fly to help you through those things. Cause that's where a lot of times you can fall by the wayside and suddenly, yeah, you get the, the dragon trapped in the tiny room. And cause it was random and you didn't have a chance to really think about it. You're like, well, how did that, Oh, what do I gotta do with that? How did, and the player's just like, really, there's just a dragon here. And it didn't know from outside the door, there's a dragon here. It's just it's a regular room. When you think about, no, the dragon probably, it, there would be some, something to tell you that. But if you're able to pull back and look at it, from the outside a little bit more, you might've seen like, oh yeah, I randomly generated a dragon in here. Now I need to set up this passage that leads to the room to kind of start to show off, show that context. All right, where was I? Let's see, I got that part. Okay, the nature of the entrance into the place itself is important. Aesthetically, you will likely want to make this entrance dramatic. A big gate or a bridged chasm, for example, from a gameplay point of view, the entrance should pose a challenge. It might be guarded, locked, barred, or even not navigable by normal means at all. The options are likely to be dictated by the gameplay requirements of the level. Do you want the player to fight, scale a cliff, have a particular skill, or acquire a special key somewhere else in the game? This site has a um, graphic symbol dungeon layout language designed to show flow. It does. Flow it do. And this is definitely kind of the five-room dungeon, because I think that first room of the fire room dungeon is the entrance which is supposed to be a challenge so i'm surprised they didn't actually i wonder if they didn't just didn't see the five room dungeon stuff because they're simply they're definitely thinking seem to be thinking along similar wavelengths so it's interesting that they're coming to these things from a different angle hey don's in the chat just popped in to wish everyone a merry christmas well merry christmas to you don happy to have you even if it's just for a pop in So far, the setup is strictly linear. However, this could be easily changed by allowing secondary entrances leading into the place from other locations within the environment. They may not be safe or easy to use. They might be guarded or well hidden, but their existence immediately expands the number of player trajectories through the level. How easy, reliable, or safe a secondary entrance is probably depends on the overall design of the level. If the environment is dangerous to travel and the secondary entrance is located deep within the environment, the secondary entrance itself can be relatively safe and easy. If the main entrance is actually not traversable, then at least one secondary entrance needs to be reliable as it possibly becomes the only way to enter the place. 
The specific challenge of secondary entrances in relation to the challenge posed by the main entrance is an important design decision. It could even be that the secondary entrances are only viable options for characters that have specific skills, knowledge, and backgrounds. For example, the side door into an underground city might need a special map, a key passed on for generations, and the services of a well-trained burglar to offset the challenge posed by the dragon keeping watch over the main entrance. I see what you did there, author. Uh, yeah, I think this is an important thing to think of. It's something useful, right? I know we're running into things that, hey, this is kind of for video games. It doesn't apply to us. But I think a lot of stuff kind of can um, apply. And this is one of them, um, which is that think about your, you know, you, you, you think about the main entrance to a castle, whatever's guarding, whatever's doing it. And you think about maybe another entrance. And I think this works whether it's a meta level, meta level thinking or even fictional thinking. If I have to go through, say the the fire swamp, and this the the exit, the second exit of the dungeon or the, the the castle is in the middle of the fire swamp, as the builder of that exit, my thought process is probably I don't need to trap the heck out of this entrance because the fire swamp is one giant trap. So especially if I might need to get out. This is, remember, these secondary entrances probably my exit. If I'm the builder of this thing and I'm inside, I need to get out. Probably don't want to put a bunch of traps in there. When I'm going to get out, I'm going to be in the middle of the fire swamp and I'm going to have that to deal with. So probably that's going to be a relatively safe, that secondary entrance itself is probably going to be relatively safe because it's so dangerous. Everything around it is, is the trap. Whereas if it were just the door to the tower, the front door, your expectation is that it should be trapped, which I think is one of the things that in, in one of the, it might've been a Lamentations adventure, one of these other, or DCC, where it got a lot of flack because basically it was, a, you're going up to a wizard's tower and I think if you use the front door, spoilers, it's basically a just save or die. And a lot of people complained, but the author's response was basically, it's a wizard's tower and you're going up to the front door. Do you not expect it to be trapped and everything, right? Which is a good point. If you're thinking in the fiction, what oh, that door look everything looks just it looks like there's nothing there like hmm like yeah it's gonna be trapped right of course if that main entrance were over uh, a lava and and and, and we're super difficult to get to probably the door itself doesn't need to be trapped because the trap is the lava and all that stuff nightbot hitting up <laughs> hitting up bob mazdal now oh i see somehow Ah, uh, he, he Bob Mossel was going going for the R O U S's uh, reference from the Princess Bride, but Nightbot thought that Bob Mossel was posting a URL. Nightbot, I've had these Russian URLs. In fact, there's one sitting right up here that they're formatting to sneak by you, and yet you're hitting up my community members for their Princess Bride references. There is injustice in you, Nightbot. Injustice. Populating the place. The structural designation suggested by the theory of the place really helped to dress and populate a level in a sensible manner. To start with, as already mentioned, it is important that the player can easily identify the place. It helps if there is some contrast between the natures of the place and the environment, respectively. But also, placing a landmark or a weenie in the place, or possibly the antechamber will help players find these locations. What the heck is a weenie? So we have structural designations, kind of landmarks. Weird. I'm not sure what Nightbot's getting on about. I suppose, Bob Monsel, if you do need to post a link, maybe putting it in the comments is better than the chat. I would guess. <laughs> Terrence pointing out that Nightbot is the definition of lawful neutral. Yeah, it seems like it. Or maybe chaotic. This is all like, like you know, complete, complete chaotic. Chaotic neutral, just uh, anything goes on its whims, just by a whim. When the place is inhabited by enemies, it makes sense for them to have their main camp inside the place, guard the entrance or the antechamber, and possibly patrol the path or the environment. Depending on the nature and difficulty of secondary entrances, these might be left unguarded. If there are two warring factions, it makes sense for one faction to dominate the place and the other the environment, with the antechamber in either hands or the locus of the current conflict. Depending on how things are connected, a secondary entrance might allow the player to bypass any encounter or challenge located in the antechamber 
In contrast, an encounter located in the place itself is much harder to avoid, and any encounter located in the environment is quite likely to be missed by the player entirely. Basically, how optional you want an encounter should to be should dictate where you put it. That's an interesting idea. If you're if you're kind of planning encounters on sort of how some almost pseudo randomness of sort of where you want it or how how uh, likely your players are to put it, kind of where you throw it. If we're talking, you know, environment, antechamber, area, you know, or encounter area, sort of where you want to slot that will will determine kind of how often your players will get there. Especially if you're looking at running having a module or something or an adventure that either you're going to publish or multiple parties you're going to run through. It's kind of interesting to think about, well, if I want them to do it all the time, I want to put it kind of in the main, say, castle or encounter area or whatever. But if I want it to be kind of on the side, maybe I should put it out in the environment and I want it to sort of be in there, then maybe that antechamber is going to be more likely. Some interesting stuff. In Magic Gathering, a weenie is a low-powered creature. Okay. All right. See, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know any, don't know any magic, Magic the Gathering lingo. Readability. One quality of the levels generated using the structure is that they, to a certain extent, create readability. There's a certain logic to navigating these levels that the player will likely pick up quickly enough. And where you might intuitively think this would expose the underlying structure and quickly grow stale, we suggest it actually does the opposite and enhances the gameplay and bolsters player agency. As the path is typically easier to navigate than the environment and the place and the antechamber are clearly marked, it is very likely that the player travels the path first in order to check out the main challenge. This introduces the opportunity to foreshadow content and the challenge along the path. The existence and nature of the environment likely hints at other possibilities but poses an interesting choice. Is it worth trying to avoid the main challenge and seek out an alternative route? And if that route can be found, can the player use it at all is it even worth the risk? This is kind of an interesting concept, right? We might think about, well, we're giving the path, you know, okay, I have the hidden city of Z and uh, I don't want them. To, I want it to be the super challenge of them to find it. I don't want to have a road or some kind of path that leads from whatever to the hidden city, blah, blah, blah. But it is an interesting idea that if you give the players the option of, oh, there's the overgrown, you know, you can barely see it against, the rest of the environment, but there is a place that seems very clear. It seems to be clearly, uh, you know, the indentations, old cobbles, stones, or just, just kind of the way it sticks out, the, the way it's different. Maybe it's just grasses instead of trees and stuff out that there was a road here and that road is leading up. That is the most direct way to the hidden city. It might, might mean though, that there uh, you're, you're going to miss out on things you might get out of the environment, or you think, Hey, this is what I want to do. I just want to take the direct way. It does kind of open up some different decisions because now you're saying to the party, hey, you have this way. Here's the way to get there. Do you want to take that route or do you want to go these other routes that may be more dangerous but have other opportunities, for lack of a better word? There might be a data if you go off-road. There might be those secondary or hidden entrances or exits if you go off-road. If you take the road, you are going to go in, but you're going to go in through the the area that's that's going to be most under observation, if there's anything there observing, it's the one that's going to take you to the main entrance, which is probably going to be the one that's the most guarded, trapped, dangerous, whatever. So you have introduced these choices. On Each one, you know, going on road has its advantages, disadvantages, going, you know, bushwhacking through the wilderness. Off road has its own advantages and disadvantages. And getting and, and seeing that context of being able to go up to the main entrance, it's probably good. Will that, you know, does that give you what information is that worth information? Do you go and check it out and then try to find other spots? Like, you know, it gives you kind of, I can definitely see how it opens up obvious choices. Cause you could think about it and say, well, of course you can do that stuff without having an obvious road. Sure you could, but having a road, I think puts that in forward in the player's mind of here is this path with all the temptations and things that that path has versus not. So I definitely think there's some interesting things in they are. Oh my gosh. And here comes more of the spammy messages. My God, how many, how much blacklisting must I do today? I tell you it's Christmas and you're forcing my hand. Spammers forcing my hand. I don't want to be unkind. For a game like Unexplored 2, these considerations are part of the core experience, and if the level structure helps the player to uncover the nature of the challenges, 
helps the player to make an informed choice. The game might strongly suggest certain approaches, but ultimately is up to the player to make the choice. The level structure dictated by the theory of the place facilitates a strategy for the player to uncover the options before committing to any of them. Furthermore, a clear and consistent structure invites player anticipation in a very similar way as a structured plot invites reader anticipation in a novel. That doesn't necessarily mean that the player needs to know what will happen exactly. The level should still be allowed to throw a couple of curveballs once in a while. This is where the variations described below come into play. But the very notion and existence of these curveballs strongly implies readability and the possible intentional encouragement to misread a level. Okay, variations. How much more do I have left here? Oh my gosh. Oh goodness. All right. I'm going to try to make it. I know I'm already well over time, but I'm going for it. I am going for it. So we got to populate place. We got to readability. All right, variations. These are, sorry, there are many possible variations on the base structure of the theory of the place. The variations discussed below are just a few examples. We suspect that there are plenty more, especially as variations take into account the specific nature and mechanics of the game. One, the environment might hide gameplay opportunities designed to overcome specific challenges posed by the place, antechamber, or secondary entrances. It is up to the player to brave the challenges of the environment of any to find them. It might even be possible to hide a key item that is needed to gain access to the place or the vault in the environment like this. It might even be wise to mark such a site with a secondary landmark or possibly use secondary landmarks as red herrings, luring the player into a hazardous area. Two, a secondary entrance might be an escape route rather than an actual entrance. Either it is impossible or very hard to use, use it to gain access to the place. Such an escape route creates the possibility that the main entrance can only be navigated once to gain entrance, creating a new and unexpected challenge of finding your way out again. Three, a secondary entrance leading directly into the vault creates an opportunity to bypass any encounters in the place. That is, if the entrance can be navigated in both ways. Perhaps the player is trapped in the vault, but has access to, to its treasure in order to deal with the challenges offered by the place itself. And then four, the place might actually be isolated from the environment, or a part of the environment might be isolated from the rest of the level. This implies that these parts of the levels are connected to other levels in some way that works and works best if the player can see the isolated parts. Ooh, all right, so we got some variations there. It is important to see the large expressive range the theory of the place has. We started implementing the structure more than halfway through development, but so far there's not been a level template for which it has not been applicable in one way or another. On the one hand, this is because many typical fantasy adventures levels fit right in. Castles and Ruins are prime examples used to illustrate this article. But the place can as easily be a clearing in a dense forest or a rocky outcrop in a swamp. You can even make a classical dungeon by setting up the place as a treasure room in that dungeon with the environment being the sprawling dungeon itself and the path likely to be hazardous or well guarded. On the other hand, the structure is intended to be flexible with a lot of opportunities to come up with interesting variations. These variations might be very specific to a particular game and its mechanics or could hint at more generic patterns that might be applied to a variety of games. The theory of the place as presented here is not set in stone but rather a starting point for the exploration of level design and generation spaces. One that we found very fruitful for our game, but one we believe would benefit other games just as easily. Implementation. One reason the theory of the place has proven to be very effective for us is that it plays really well with the way we have set up our level generator. Without going into too much detail, Unexplored 2's level generator makes use of a series of transformation steps using transformational grammars to generate levels from pre-designed templates. These templates indicate the structure a level should have, can specify gameplay features to be placed in the level, and suggest themes the level generator can use to flesh things, these things out. In short, the level templates are a direct reflection of the structures described by the theory of the place. The structure, gameplay requests, and themes are passed to the generator as a set of instructions. For example, the structure might look something like this. Uh, structure, so we have structure, medium size, plus place is central, plus place has vault, plus entrance by bridge, plus path leads south and down, plus build hazardous environment. The request, room is place, add fortifications, add landmark, room is vault, treasure chest, room is antechamber, plus spawn guard, room is environment, add opportunity, themes, forest, snap, root, trees, secret paths. So all this stuff is obviously very kind of programmy, whatever, but you can see kind of an interesting way you could look at these in terms of in a hex crawl, 
having a quick way of identifying some things about particular hexes without writing it all up at once. You know, inside some area, what are these things we can say about if we have like, oh, look, on my hex, there's a little icon of a tower. And I could write about that tower. Well, what do these particular things mean? Maybe I don't want to write all the details. And I don't want to totally generate the tower right here because I'm going to generate 50 odd places and I don't have time. And this is just high level. And the party might never get here. But maybe I could write a couple things about the tower. So I write down, okay, in hex one comma one tower entrance by bridge, you know, path leads south. It's in a you know, the forest, you know, secret paths, a couple of these things. And those notations I could have my own kind of generator, probably in the form of random tables. And then great. Now I have these things I could take. And instead of just using a whole slew of random generation, I can have more, more targeted random generation or inspiration, maybe random inspiration generation to come up with some things that fit these things. And I could over time create a bunch of tables for, okay, it's got a bridge and you know, whatever. I don't need it. I don't probably don't need a random generator, but for a bridge, but maybe some of the other things, what kind of fortifications, what kind of landmark, what kind of treasure, what kind of guards, you know, that kind of thing. Or I could have other places that don't have any guards, but have these other things. And I can just kind of come up with that really quickly and then come back to it later when I need to fill it in with content. First, the structure creates the rough outline for the level. It generates a place in the center of a medium-sized level by activating specific transformational grammar rules to that effect. It then adds a vault to it and connects it to an antechamber via a bridge. Next, it creates a path south and places the entrance at the level's border and creates an environment branching out from the path and possibly looping back at convenient places. All parts of the level are marked with their respective structural rules. Next, the request indicates the specific locations within that structure, room is place, and can activate rules to decorate and populate the level to specification. Finally, the themes are used by the level generator to fill in the other details. In this case, they, they serve to make the, sure the environment and its hazards are made to fit with a forest theme with dangerous trees and secret paths. The actual templates we use for Unexplored 2 are more complex and detailed. Most importantly, they allow for some randomness as well. Instead of specific instructions, we can also specify a range of possible instructions at any place in the list. And given the generative grammar approach we take to generation, is actually quite easy to generate these instructions from dedicated grammars themselves. So here we have, and then we have a picture, kind of an example with an entrance, paths, kind of the environment, antechamber, and the place with some secondary entrances. Oh my God, yet another one. What is up with you? All the spammers are here. How many must I block? How many must I block? So pretty cool stuff. I could definitely see coming up with one and use it with tables. I might have to kind of try this out because I think there's some interesting things in here, especially like I said, when we wanted to find a bunch of places in the hex crawl and we just want to use some just overall, maybe we have some ideas, but we don't want to go through and, and do the whole thing, create, creating a tower, let's say. Okay, let's just create some specific uh, 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 characteristics that we can lay down now while it's in our brains. And then when we need to, we can come back and generate the rest either from whatever inspiration we have in our heads or from some specific tables. Uh, Bob Mostel and, and Terrence. <laughs> now it's going to be something where, where people in the chat are legitimately trying to fool me into blocking them as spammers. I don't want to block anyone by accident. Although I do be Dodd Bletch. If you want to see more about the specifics of Temple Design for Unexplored 2, we can recommend you check out our dev channel on Twitch. All right, so they do some dev stuff. Probably beyond, definitely, I'm not going to go to Twitch now. Beyond my scope, but good to know. You can click on the link and then check out their Twitch channel for more. Chaining and nesting places. In general, the places we have been discussing this far are relatively small. A single place with a few optional challenges and one or two encounters. Although we have learned from experience that in many cases there is much more merit to these smallish places, there are cases where we want the levels to be larger. Rather than expanding the place structure described above, we found the solution in chaining and nesting the structures into larger holes. Chaining levels is relatively simple. The place of a level that might contain a passage to the start of the next level. In fact, the whole reason the player wants to reach the place 
might be because they want to continue to the next level. Linking levels in this way can easily create chains or branching trees of levels. But Unexplored 2 wouldn't be a worthy sequel if we didn't come up with a way to include multiple connections and cycles in this structure as well. Then they have an image, which is an example of a castle that connects to a crypt, which the crypt is one level, the castle is a separate level. By adding connections between levels from other locations within their structures, it becomes possible to replicate the base structure of the theory of the place on the level of a collection of levels in addition to the level of each individual level. Oh my gosh, Whew. how many times about we're going to say level? For example, if a castle place harbors a staircase into a crypt, second length level, it might be possible to create an extra passage somewhere from the environment of the castle to the environment of the crypt. In effect, this creates the functional equivalent of a secondary entrance to the castle itself. Oh, walk in the path. All your base belong to us. Exactly. I kind of feel like this could, you could really do some, if you were someone who liked point crawling, I feel like these sorts of things, man, you could really adapt into point crawling. So I think these concepts are just with paths leading to these kind of uh, nexus points that lead to other paths, lead to other nexus points is really could help add some structure to point crawling. If you're someone that likes to point crawl. Each connection itself might also be expanded into a complete level in and of itself. For example, an underground tunnel level might create an alternative connection between the environment and a place as illustrated in the castle level below. In the grander scheme, a third level reachable from a secret room, the place, within the crypt, fills the same structural role as a vault, especially if the crypt also hides a special key mechanism that is required to enter the secret room. Conversely, the theory of the place might even be applied within the confines of a single room where the room itself might be the environment and a platform on the far end of the room could be the place with clearly marked path flanked by columns leading up to the platform. All right, so we can nest these things all along, which is kind of what I, I saw from the beginning, this concept where you could nest nest these things and put throw a bunch of them together. That's basically what they're saying here. Now we have an extended example. The level playthrough described below illustrates how all these things come together. It is a castle level generated for Unexplored 2. The level includes a number of encounters. There's a nest of skidders, skiders, a monster particular to Unexplored 2. There's also an inoperative magic gate and some treasure hidden inside the castle. All three encounters are placed in the level individually and independently of the level's template. Each could be a reason for the player to explore the castle. So we are looking at a kind of diagram of the castle. It's in kind of a valley. It's sort of in kind of a valley, then you enter uh, a, an area that, that has an entrance that goes and goes up a cliff face into the area proper, which then has two separate areas. And it looks like it has something on the side. So you enter the level. We're going to call it from the southeast. If you just go straight north, you're going to find some skider or skitter. I'm going to call it skider eggs. You're going to find coming through an area that the main castle gate is broken. It's, I think it's supposed, I think it was supposed to be magic. If you go all the way to the West, you'll find some of these skiders that guard a secondary entrance, which leads it to a tunnel system it has a bunch of stuff. And then from that tunnel system leads you stairs to get you to the main main uh main courtyard and then there's a skider brood mother and then got more stuff and then there's a shrine on the inside then there's a key and then there's some treasure pretty cool that looks i mean if someone put this up on on as a rp you now as a tabletop location i mean it looks cool so it's interesting how they were able to kind of get some, what I would say, decent tabletop role-playing design. Okay, you got a magic gate clocked, but you can go down here, get in. There's probably a way to, you know, maybe there's a, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of skimming this part of it, the description, because it's hard to go back and forth between the, the map and the text. But, I mean, it looks pretty cool to me. Looks like an interesting enough level to run. Well, let's see. Okay, a few alternative route routes routes exist through this level if you have a powerful enough spell item you might have been able to smash your way through the gate or possibly you could have used a teleportation device to make your way into the place 
A difficult climb inside the cavern would have allowed you to bypass some of the skiders and the secret door. A more dramatic trajectory might have started as the player enters the level through the magic gate right at the heart of the castle. In this setup, there's a couple of variations that can drastically change things. For example, the main gate could also be open, locked with the same key used for one of the interior doors, or open with a lever from inside the courtyard. The magic gate might be located inside the building, or the building and the tunnel might be connected directly, either inside of or complementary to the stairs leading up to the courtyard. Different encounters could also put a spin on things. If bandits occupied the castle, they might have set up their camp in the court and guarded the cave entrance, but not inside of the cave. Or the main objective might have been a larger treasure located at a different room with the party of competing fortune seekers camping in the castle or the cave entrance. Basically, you can kind of reconfigure things around and still have really interesting interactions, even if some of them are different than what their generator did, that you can put multiple different spins on things. Finally, the conclusion. All in all, Oh, we are quite happy with the theory of the place. As I hope to have illustrated, it helps us generate levels that create interesting challenges for Unexplored 2. Even though the structure itself seems to be quite obvious, it turns out that it is very, very important that our level generator is able to work with its elements deliberately. It leads us to conclude that a level generator can only be as good as the design philosophy it implements and or is able to express. We strongly believe that the value of the theory of the place is not restricted to the generation of levels for our game. Its ideas can easily be, be easily incorporated into other level generators, but also inform handcrafted level design. We have found that the schematics create a very different shorthand notation for level ideas. It has already proved to be quite invaluable to keep track of the template designs and the structural variations each temp template encompasses. In addition, we have been harvesting and brainstorming level design patterns using this notation and theory. It certainly seems to adhere to the original philosophy behind design patterns in that, according to Christopher Alexander, design patterns need to be informed by a theory about what constitutes quality in the domain of pattern language. In our context, level generation for a roguelite action RPG, the theory of the place, definitely performs wonderfully. Whew. All right. Well, thanks, folks, for hanging in there with me. I'm almost double the time of one of my normal sessions, but I think it was worthwhile. I thought this was a really interesting piece i think there's a lot of takeaways i would i think i might have to tinker with this i think between this and kind of five room dungeons coming up with a shorthand when you're wanting to define some overall characteristics for locations and hex crawl without doing everything is a really nice midpoint between hey i'm going to just do the full development of a place like mapping it out and all that stuff versus just a little blurb it gives us some stuff and then we could if we have random tables and other generative tools we can kind of hook those into some of these keywords to help uh, do some kind of definitions and things without going too far. Oval Team Patrol says, internet stuff. Have a good afternoon and a Merry Christmas. Absolutely, because I have got to run. I've been on here too long. My voice is almost gone. Thanks, everyone, for hanging out with me. I will be streaming tomorrow at the usual time. Probably do the uh, Reddit roundup. Hopefully my game, my home game is tonight. So hopefully that will be that and then i'll be off for christmas and then i will see you next week after christmas but like i said should be on tomorrow if that changes i will let you know everybody have a great day or night whenever you're watching or listening to this game on i'll talk to you later